A reading from Luke, the 14th chapter. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and he said to them, If any of you come to me, and you do not hate your father and your mother, and your wife and your children, and yes, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. If you don't pick up your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. The Greek word translated as disciple, it refers to a, a learner, a student, someone like an, in medicine, someone like an intern or a resident who's with us all the time, just listening and watching to learn how to be. Is there anyone here who, planning to build a new house, doesn't first sit down and figure the cost so you'll know if you can complete it? If you only get the foundation laid and then run out of money, you're going to look pretty foolish. Everyone passing by will make fun of you. <laughs> he started something he couldn't finish. Or can you imagine a king going into battle against a ki another king without first deciding whether it is possible with his 10,000 troops to face the 20,000 troops on the other side? And if he decides he can't, won't he send an emissary and work out a truce? So therefore, if you're not re willing to renounce all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. For the word of God in Scripture, even these words, for the word of God among us and the word of God within us, thanks be to God. So, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, any kids who'd like to come forward and give me a and give me a hand with our children's message. Uh, come right on up. I've got, got some stuff I need some help with. I see some folks coming up here. Yeah. Hey, guys. Sorry. All right, thank you. All right, friends, so I have a question for all of you. Has anyone here ever had to do something really hard? Raise your hand if you've had to do something really hard. Kate, what was the hard thing you had to do? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Getting your ears pierced? That does sound hard. I've never had to do that, but I've heard that it doesn't feel very good. That was pretty hard. Anyone else have something hard they've had to do before? What do you think? Any other things that are hard? Do you go to have to learn anything really hard at school? Sometimes? Maybe, like, when, do you remember when you were learning how to read? Was it hard at first? No, you did really good. Well, good for you. That's good. Well, it was hard for me to learn how to read. It took me a while. But there are lots of hard things that we have to do sometimes. And how, how do you get a hard thing done? What did you have to do? Like, when you were getting your ears pierced, does, was there anything that could help make it a little easier? Ah, uh, you think about the reward at the end with the fancy new earrings. That's a good one. Any other ways we can, we can make something hard a little bit easier? Well, I'll tell you what. I have something hard I need to do today. I have laundry to do. I think that's pretty hard sometimes. And right now, I have, I have this big, giant sheet, and I have to fold it. And I think that's sometimes kind of hard to do. And this isn't even the fitted sheet. I, I gave up on trying to fold those a long time ago. But do you think I can get it done? Do you think if I try really hard or think about how good it's going to look at the end, it'll work? Okay, you want to watch? Let's see if I can do it. Okay, I got to get it. It's really big. Hang on. Hang on. I almost got it. Am I doing good so far? I'm not. What could I do to make this easier? I could lay it down. Is there anything else we could do to make it easier? Could you guys help me make it easier? Is sometimes getting a helper, someone to help you, something we can do if something's really hard? Maybe. Let's go with yes for this children's sermon at the very least. <laughs> all right. Can you guys all take a corner? And you guys are going to be my helper. See if you can find a corner. Good job. Here we go. Pick it up. All right. Let's see if together we can fold my laundry here. Okay. Which corners? Should we take these corners over to them? Let's bring them all this way. Okay. Bring the corners together. Okay, and grab this corner down here, Sully. There you go. Can you grab the corner down at the bottom? 
Very good. Okay, now which way should we fold it? To me? You guys can bring it up to me. Come up the stairs carefully. There you go. Keep going. Keep going. Come on, Sully. We're going to bring these corners together. Oh, now it's looking good. There we go. Mine sometimes get a little funky, too. Okay, we got one more fold to do. Which way should we fold it, Sebastian? That way, maybe? Towards Kate? Okay, let's bring it together. Bring it together. All right. Look at that. That's pretty good. It looks like a pillow. It's all folded. You guys were able to help me get something really hard done. And do you know what, guys? Sometimes God asks us to do things that are pretty hard. Sometimes God asks us to love people who are kind of hard to love. Sometimes God asks us to give our money or our things away, and we really don't want to do that sometimes. Sometimes God asks us even to change our whole lives. What we do as a job or how we work in the world, God wants us to do really important things. And those can be really hard. But what can we do when there are really hard things? You remember? We can ask for help. And who do you think can help us? Parents? God? How about all these people out here? Do you know why we're all here today in church? We're here today to help each other. Because God has asked all of us to do some pretty hard things. And we come here to worship so that we can help each other. We can be helpers for each other in doing what God wants. And there's one more helper that God talks about in the Bible. You know what that is? God talks about the Holy Spirit. And the Bible, the Holy Spirit can be kind of like a dove or like fire or like amazing things that we see around. But the Holy Spirit, she can also show up in each and every one of us. Have you guys been helpers before? Have you ever been a helper to somebody? I could tell you guys had some experience with the laundry at least. I know you've been helpers before. It's kind of a little bit. That's okay. But when you're a helper, you have God's Holy Spirit inside of you. And we can help do amazing things in the world. And that's what we're all supposed to do. When God asks hard things of us, we can always get help and we can be helpers. So guys, you did awesome. Let's fold our hands and we're going to say a prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for making us. Thank you for loving us. Help us to do hard things and be helpers to others. Amen. Thank you, guys. You did a great job. I'll see you later. Pray with me. God, this is one of those Bible texts that we wish weren't in it. Will you open our eyes and our ears so that we can see and hear what it means for our lives? Did you ever wonder if maybe Jesus did not want many disciples? I mean, he seems to make it so hard. One time a man said to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go, but first let me bury my father. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. You come and follow me. That doesn't attract many people, does he? Does it? And another time, Jesus said he had not come to bring peace, but division, so that in a family of five, they would be divided, two against three and three against two. That doesn't attract the focus on the family crowd, does it? And then this reading from today makes being a disciple sound even harder. It would be easy to get the impression that Jesus did not want many disciples, but the issue was not the number of disciples he wanted. It was about their faithfulness. There was an article in the New York Times a few years ago entitled, What Religion Would Jesus Belong To? And the first line in the article was, one puzzle of the world is that religions often do not resemble their founders. 
Is that true of Christianity? In ancient times and in Jesus' time, religious teachers emphasized the cost of being their disciples, their students, their interns, because they wanted disciples who would become like them, who would follow them, even to death if that were necessary. But in today's gospel, Jesus was on his final journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, and large crowds were following him. They knew where he was going. They knew he had set his face to go to Jerusalem, and the crowds were looking forward to see what would happen when he got there. The crash, the conflict between Jesus and the Jewish authorities, between the Jews and the Romans, it was exciting. It felt like a parade. They had no idea that he was on his way to be crucified. But he knew what the cost of his faithfulness would be. So he turned to the, turned to the crowd and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and his wife and his children and even himself, he cannot be my disciple. Can you imagine their response? Jesus, what are you talking about? Don't you remember the commandment to honor your father and your mother? You want us to hate our father and your mother? What about your teaching, Jesus, that we're supposed to love our enemies? Does that exclude our, fer- our parents, our families? You can understand why they had questions. It helps if we remember that sometimes words have different meanings. That is true now, and it was true back then. Think of all the different ways we use the word love. I love God. I love my new electric car. (laughs) Think of the different ways we use hate. Man, I hate it when I lose. I hate the man that sells drugs to my child. The same thing was true about the word hate back in Genesis and in Jesus' time. Sometimes in the Bible, the word hate did not refer to the bitter hatred that people have for one another, like the hate Cain had for Abel, enough hate to kill him. Sometimes it means something very different. In Jewish speech, And in Aramaic, to hate meant to love less. You remember the verse in Genesis that says, God loved Jacob, but he hated Esau? It didn't mean that he hated Esau. God is a God of love. He meant that he loved Jacob more than he loved Esau. He loved Esau less. And the verb, the verse that says, Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah, and Leah was hated by Jacob. That didn't mean that Jacob had a bitter hatred for Leah. It meant that Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. He loved Leah less. So if Jesus is telling us to love our father and our mother and our wife and our children and even ourselves to love them less, What does that mean? Who does he want us to love more than our families, more than ourselves? Him. He wants us to love him more than any person or anything in our life. His question for us is, who do we choose to be the center of our life? Will it be our family? Will it be our occupation, our work? Will it be our pleasure? We really only have two options. Will it be God as we know God through Jesus, or will it be me? A few years ago, Frank Sinatra sang a song that ended with these lyrics. For what is a man, what has he got? If not himself, then he has not. 
to say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took the blows and did it my way. That's the option many people choose, to be the center of their life, to do life their way. We'll come back to that. The crowds felt like they were in a, a parade, but Jesus asked them with the parable about the man building a tower and the king going to war, to think about what they were doing and to think about whether or not they were willing to bear the cost that would come with being his disciple. We love hearing about God's grace and God's love, but here Jesus is telling us we also need to consider the costs of loving him above all else. Many sermons on this text today will focus on Jesus' words about bearing your cross. Many preachers will quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German Christian who was martyred two weeks before the end of World War II. Bonhoeffer famously said, when Christ calls a man, he calls him to come and die. And many other preachers will describe how the cost of Martin Luther King Jr.'s discipleship was his death. But for most of us, Jesus is not asking us to die for him, is he? What is he asking us to do? To live for him. It's something like a couple deciding whether or not to have a child. If you do, it will change your life everything in your life from then on. We may think about the cost of following Jesus and ask ourselves, do I want to do this? Can I do this? Can I love him? Can I follow him like that? We would make such a mistake if we thought about the cost of being Jesus' disciples and said, no, I, I can't do it, I'll, I'll do life my way. In our gospel today, Jesus says the words, he cannot be my disciple, three times. The Greek word that's translated as cannot, the Greek word is dunamai, and it's better translated as is not able. The truth is that we are not able on our own to be the disciples Jesus wants us to be, to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. But the good news is that Jesus knew that, knew that we would need help. And so at the Last Supper with his disciples, Jesus said to them, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. And that helper, the Spirit of God with us and within us, will enable us, make us able, over time, to be the people God wants us to be. So that you become a social worker, rather than the lawyer that your parents so badly wanted you to be. You become a teacher and you choose to teach in an underprivileged area with underprivileged students, even though your salary will be less for your spouse and your children than if you taught in Hinsdale. And you choose to become a hospice nurse with all of the grief that will be involved in it even though you can't even watch the movie Bambi without dissolving in tears. The helper, the Spirit of God with us and within us will enable us, make us able over time to be the disciples Jesus wants us to be. And at the end, when we stand before God, we will not say, I did it my way. 
but rather God is likely to say to us, you did it my way. Amen.